Tonight, like I said, we'll look at the erotic or the embodied. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Um, this physical nature of our sexuality. And then notice, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him, fit for him. That's the unitive or the relational aspect. And when we put them together, we get a three-dimensional view of God's plan for sexuality. And although we're going to look at one side at a time, until we get all three on the table, we won't see the whole picture. Um, these three uh, aspects of sexuality are re referenced broadly in people who discuss these issues. For example, Peter Kreeft is a Catholic apologist, and notice what he says. He says, husbands and wives give to each other as much as it is humanly possible to give their whole selves. Body, soul, life, time, friends, world, possession, children, nothing is held back. That is why the church, notice the capital C there, he's a Catholic, that is why the church opposes artificial contraception, because it's the deliberate holding back of the procreative ingredient in marriage, just as test tube babies are a deliberate holding back of the unitive ingredient, and Victorian puritanical fears hold back the joyful erotic ingredient. So he references there all three in fact, he names them here. God designed all three to be one, unitive, procreative, and erotic, two in one flesh, intimacy, third-party procreation, first-party self-forgetful ecstasy. It's all here. Now, he starts to lay out an idea there that we'll come back to, that there is not just three sides. When I say three-dimensional, I really mean there are three dimensions to our sexuality, but we'll see that better in just a minute. Uh, this is John Stott evangelical, amazing thinker and benefit of many Christians. And notice what he says here. Classical theology has followed the biblical revelation in identifying three main purposes for which God ordained marriage. It's also usually listed them in the order in which they're mentioned in Genesis 1 and 2, while adding that priority of order does not necessarily signify priority of importance. Firstly, the man and woman were commanded to be fruitful and increase in numbers, so procreation of children has normally headed the list, together with their upbringing within the love and discipline of the family. Secondly, God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Thus, God intended marriage, to quote the 1662 Book of Common Prayer again, for the mutual society, help and comfort that one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Thirdly, marriage is intended to be reciprocal, commitment of self-giving love which finds its natural expression in self, uh, sexual union or becoming one flesh. And so John Stott uh, lays out all three, and so does Lisa Sal Cahill, who is a teacher of ethics at Boston College uh, and also a Christian. And notice what she says, deficient moral behavior or an adequate moral analysis can result from the truncation or the division of the pleasurable, that's the erotic, the intimate, that's the unitive, and the procreative meanings. In fact, notice this, human sexual experience is complex and complete when all three bodily dimensions of sex are developed through the three levels, bodily, personal, social. So notice this, the erotic aspect of sexuality has to do with you and your desires. The unitive adds another layer, a second dimension, by bringing a relationship with another person. The two become one, and procreation brings in the third dimension by pushing it beyond the marriage and into the realm of family and, uh, uh, and as we'll see in a few nights, also society. And that's what I mean when I say it's three-dimensional. It's, it's, uh, it's not just three facets, but three levels, bodily, personal, and social, integrated in relationships over time. Tonight we're going to talk about embodied sexuality, and we're going to do so by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, the second half. Now, um, this passage is a difficult one, because the letter to the Corinthians is one of the more difficult books of the New Testament, so we're going to have to do quite a lot more open hood exegesis working with the text tonight than you've probably done in the past. I promise I've got some visual aids and we'll take our time. We'll lay that foundation. Um, but what I want you to notice right off front on this passage is its emphasis on the body. Now, Flannery O'Connor uh, was a short story author, one of my favorites, uh, a essential component of American literature, and she wrote a book labeled, named for the chapter we're about to read, 
a book uh, or a story called The Temple of the Holy Ghost. And I found this quote that connects where she was thinking, what her head was at in writing the story. I wish I had time to tell it to you tonight, uh, but I would encourage you to go looking for it. It's not hard to find. But notice what she says here. She says, I'm almost always astonished at the emphasis the church, guess what, she's Catholic, the church puts on the body. It's not the soul that will rise, but the body glorified. I've always thought that purity was the most mysterious of the virtues, but it occurs to me never to have entered the human consciousness to conceive of purity if it were not to look forward to the resurrection body, which will be flesh and spirit united in peace the way they were in Christ. She says she's astonished by the emphasis the church puts on the body. I don't think we always have that astonishment. I think we might miss it. And so it's important as we read tonight that we uh, are freshly astonished by the focal point Paul makes here on our physical bodies. Read the text with me here. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, free, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body." Over and over again, the word that he hammers here is that word body, and it's somewhat surprising, because if we were in Paul's shoes and were trying to speak to those who had no problem in the Christian uh, world with prostitution, with uh, economic exchange for sex outside of marriage, we would think that they were being too focused on the body. And as we'll see tonight, Paul actually says they're not focused enough on the body. All right, so... As I have mentioned before, the letter of Corinthians is like overhearing a cell phone conversation. Many of Paul's letters, of course, are written, all of Paul's letters are written to audiences that are not us, and so we always have a little bit of thinking to do to figure out what the context was that Paul is addressing. Uh, but in Corinthians, it's especially difficult because this is not the initial letter. This is a response letter. There's another letter we don't have, written not by Paul, but the church of Corinth to Paul, and he is both responding to that as well as a report he's heard from a friend of his who's been to visit the church recently. And so what that means is, like overhearing that cell phone conversation, there are essential details that we have to nail down before we understand even the things we know Paul says. Now, he opens up here. And I want to look just at this first paragraph here, just the first three verses, 12 through 14 there. I want to focus in on that. And as we do so, he begins by saying, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Okay. Now, what you need to recognize to rightly understand this text is what commentators call Corinthian slogans. Okay. We call them Corinthian slogans because they are not the words of Paul, but Paul repeating the words of the Corinthian church. Now, you probably can't see the quotations at the beginning of verse 12 on my slide there, but if you look at your Bible, they're probably there. Almost all interpreters and translators are in agreement that when Paul says, all things are lawful for me, that's not Paul making a statement, but a quotation. He's introducing what he's about to respond to, which is why the next thing that he says is, but... In fact, one of the things that's interesting about these Corinthian slogans is as we find them, Paul never just slams them down and shuts the door. He always says, yes, but. He says, that's true, but it's not the most important truth. 
that's fine, but you're missing something more significant. And so here, yeah, sure, all things are lawful. In fact, it's easy for us to understand that probably the place Corinthians coined this slogan from was from Paul's own teaching. Paul, who teaches, for example, in the book of Romans, that Christians are no longer under the law. Paul, who in the book of Galatians reminds us that we walk by faith and are saved by faith and not by the law. And so the law is not over us. However, just because Christ has set us free from the law doesn't free us up to live as we wish. But more importantly here, Paul is just very practical. The first thing he says is, but not all things are helpful. In other words, they're asking, what is permitted for me to do? And Paul says, that's not the same thing as beneficial, right? Now, more important than that, this word here for helpful, when we read it, as autonomous, individual-centered Americans, we think, but not all is helpful for me. I would suggest to you that Paul's idea is actually helpful in the most basic sense, helpful for other people. One of the reasons I say that is because the Corinthians are so into this slogan, it comes up again later on here in chapter 10, um, We'll come back to that in just a second. That's really good. Um, Later on here in chapter 10, when he's dealing with their practice of eating food sacrificed to idols, again we see here, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. But notice what's paired with it. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Not all things build up. Okay? And so what he suggests in his opening comment here is, you're right, In a sense, we are no longer bound by the law, but we are bound by the law of love. He says it's not beneficial for other people. You may be free to visit prostitutes, but is it a loving act towards the person you're paying for sex? He says you're getting the wrong answer because you're asking the wrong question. Now, what's really interesting is Paul doesn't just begin with that Corinthian slogan. But this whole paragraph, verses 12 through 14, is full of a repeated antagonist that Paul is responding to. They speak, and he responds. That's very hard to see in the text as it is formatted in your Bible, and so I've broken it down for you so that you can see the back and forth. Watch this with me. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, the Corinthians say, but I will not be dominated by anything. And then the Corinthians say, and this is really important, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And Paul responds, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you see how those statements are parallel? Food, stomach, stomach, food. Body, Lord, Lord, body. And then notice the Corinthians say, God will destroy both one and the other. And Paul says, no, God raised up Jesus, and he's also going to give you a resurrected body. Do you see how that makes better sense of the text so it doesn't look like Paul is having some sort of schizophrenic episode? (laughs) Paul isn't saying that the body is going to be destroyed, and so it doesn't matter. He's saying, you say that, but that's not theologically accurate. Okay? And so it's very important that we see what's going on here. Now, the first thing he says is, you're saying, aren't I permitted to do this? And he's saying, is it beneficial? Notice the second one, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Here, the Corinthian church says, I am free to do this. And he says, but are you free not to? What he's recognizing here is that when we give ourselves into particular behaviors, sometimes we enslave ourselves unto those particular behaviors. And so basically, he wants them to ask two different questions. Is it beneficial for others? And does it leave me in a place of freedom? Am I free as unto the Lord? Or I'm still, am I a still a slave to lustful desires or to anything else whose name is not Jesus? Okay. And so again, they say, uh, they say here, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Now remember, we know where we're going in this passage. What Paul is really addressing is prostitution. So why are we talking about diet? Understand the logic of the Corinthian church here. They say, look, I have a stomach. I get hungry. I eat. My stomach's no longer hungry. No big deal. It's just a natural desire, and I'm satisfying it with a natural thing. It's a physical desire, and it's a physical reality. No harm, no foul, right? 
Well, in other words, they're not really talking about food and stomachs. They're, talking about, they're not really talking about hunger. They're talking about a different desire and a different part of the body and satisfying that part of the body. And so, interestingly enough, the Corinthians here, all the way back in the first century, say something that suddenly sounds very contemporary. Sex is merely a bodily appetite. You see, one of the paradoxes of, of our times is that the world believes two crazy, incompatible things. One, because it's just the body, because it's just a bodily appetite, sex is no big deal. And two, sex is such a big deal that if I don't find it, if I'm not met in what I need in my sexuality, then I'm somehow hindered from being fully human. In fact, we've made it a primary source of identity. How can it be merely a bodily impulse and the primary core of who we really are? As Christians, we actually have a paradox as well. It's just the opposite one. We believe that sex is so significant that it deserves to be maintained and policed by a particular ethic. And we think it's so important that you can have a good and fulfilling life without it, like Jesus did. You can pick your paradox, but the biblical paradox is the second one. And so Paul clarifies here, and he goes, yes, the stomach for food and food for the stomach but they go on and they say, and God will destroy both one another, one and the other. And he says, now wait a minute. God's plan for our bodies is not that we would escape them, not that we would be set free from them. That is a Greek idea. That's what we call platonic dualism. That is actually the danger of Gnostic thought in the New Testament creeping in that sees all material things as bad, and as lesser, and therefore salvation and righteousness is to be disembodied. Plato taught that the body was a cage, and the soul was a bird trapped in that cage. And so here they go, it doesn't really matter because it's just this earthen vessel. And he goes, but your body is not meant for sexual immorality. It's meant for the Lord. Now, what's even more fascinating is then he says, and the Lord for the body. Okay, We read that first one and you go, okay, fine. My body belongs to Jesus. I was bought with a price, so I don't get to choose what I do with my body anymore. Somebody else is in charge of what I do with my body. Maybe like uh, the story that, um, that Watchman Nee tells of when he was traveling on a train and some passengers turned to him and said, we're about to play a game of hearts, but we need a fourth. Would you play with us? And he said, I'm sorry, but these hands don't belong to me, they belong to Jesus, and so they don't play cards. Now, I don't think Jesus would have any problem playing cards, but is that the mere idea here? When he adds, and the Lord for the body, he means that there's something about the coming of Jesus itself that is focused on you physically. Jesus came for your body, not just for your soul, okay? In fact, not only did God send Jesus for the body, but the same one who physically raised Jesus from the dead will also physically raise us when he returns. Heaven is not this ethereal, disembodied existence, but the new heavens and new earth with our untainted, unfallen, unbroken, undiseased, perfect bodies, resurrected bodies. Okay. And so they here, the Corinthians, see prostitution as merely physical. And so it's not a big deal. And Paul doesn't critique them for being too physically minded, but not physically minded enough. Their view of sexuality is very closely related to the modern view of sex that reduces sexual ethics like we've talked about down to consent. Jonathan Grant, who wrote a book called Divine Sex, uh, gives us four myths of the modern view of sex, and we'll see some similarities here with what we've been reading. Okay, The first one, sex is merely a natural desire for physical pleasure. Physical desire, physical pleasure that meets it, that's all there is to it. Okay. This perspective rests on the foundational belief that sexual desire is simply the longing for a certain type of sensory physical pleasure 
Sex is said to be a natural appetite like eating, so sexual craving merely seeks to satisfy this physical hunger. It is not anchored in any deeper and more holistic desire towards another person. The second myth, he says, builds upon the first. Fulfillment, then, is found in perfecting technique. Okay. If sex is just about physical pleasure, a happiness technology, then the key to fulfillment is to maximize and intensify the sensation by perfecting technique. The key, then, is not what we express in sex, but what we experience. Okay. Now, notice that when we make something that is inherently relational, sexuality, a happiness technology, then it turns the other person into a tool towards our happiness. It is inherently disembodying. In fact, it is inherently dehumanizing. He adds two more that are worth covering here, even though we don't see them as much in the Corinthian church. They are essential for understanding how we think about sex. The third is that repressing sexual urges will harm us. This is Freud. Freud figured that most of the things that are wrong in the human mind are based in in or unmet sexual urges. And so what he said was effectively, by not rightly expressing our sexual urges, it harms us psychologically. Put it simply, Jonathan Grant says, sexual restraint is like bottling unbearable stress, whereas free sexual expression leads to health and maturity. Okay. And then finally, we need to free ourselves from negative attitudes like guilt and shame. If what's holding us back is any restraint on this sexuality, then guilt and shame become obstacles to health and maturity. And so throwing off the religious mores or the things that restrain us is not merely seen as um, getting rid of old and outdated traditions, but the only way to experience true health. Okay. Um, now... Again, Paul's response, although it's rooted in the work of Christ, although it's all about their salvation, is not to emphasize the spiritual nature of that salvation, but the physical nature of it. And so let's talk about that for just a second. Okay. As we've already seen, the body is created by God, and it was created as good. The physicality of our nature was part of God's original design that he oversaw and looked at and labeled very good. Not only that, but Jesus took on a body. God became flesh. And not just temporarily, but permanently. That's why Daniel 11 is so striking when it says the Son of Man receives the kingdoms. There's a human being on the thrones of heaven. But God takes no hesitation, puts on no airs about taking on that physicality. I mentioned earlier Gnosticism. Gnosticism took a view that separated spiritual and physical and said spiritual good, physical bad. In fact, they were so in, uh, set on this belief that they believed that the one true God could not possibly have made the world. Instead, he made a spiritual being who made a lesser spiritual being and so on and so forth. And there was a little bit of degrading in the quality until an aeon, one of these created spiritual beings created by a spiritual being and so on and so forth, one of these aeons was corrupted enough to make the world. Okay. That's why John does something amazing in John chapter 1 when he says, in the beginning was the word. All the Gnostics go, yeah, we believe in the word. That's our language. Tell us more. And then what does he do in verse 14? He says, the word became flesh. I love that. John speaks the language of his culture, but he speaks the truth of Christianity with that language. But here, uh, Jesus takes on a body and now, like I said, has a raised one. Our bodies also will be raised. As we saw in Romans 8, 23, we are now currently groaning with all creation, awaiting our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay. not the releasing from our bodies. Okay. This is not Greek dualism, but what theologians call psychosomatic unity. Okay. So here's another thing that it's not that's also a common modern idea, materialism. Materialism says you are merely your body. 
That's all it is. Any impulse you have towards love, any sense you have of right or wrong, that's just firing synapses and chemicals that are rooted in an instinctual pattern going back to your ancestors and just are expressed. Okay. The Bible doesn't believe in dualism or in materialism, but presents psycho, your soul, somatic, soma, your body, unity. In other words, you're not merely your body, but you clearly are your body. Your body is clearly you. I honestly think this has to be hammered because we've been so loose in our language as Christians that we've preached a disembodied gospel. When we talk about saving souls, side note, the Hebrew word we translate souls, nefesh, does not mean some ethereal, real part of you that's just driving this vehicle called your body. It means you as a living being. But when we use that word soul, that's what we think of. We think of disembodied. Uh, So often when we talk about these things, we've stripped away through tradition and misunderstanding the Bible's emphasis on these things. And if we're going to understand erotic desire and what it means, we have to get it back. This is so important that I actually want to take some time to walk you through a logical argument uh, that is made here in a great book called What is Marriage? Sharif Gerges, Ryan T. Anderson, and Robert George wrote this originally as a long article for the Harvard Journal of Law and Civil Policy. I do not know if any of these men are Christians, and although they engage with the idea of a one-flesh union, they do it primarily as uh, as a facet of Western culture and not a biblical teaching. Okay. What they're saying is culture for a long time in the West has seen something significant about marriage specifically in what they call the conjugal view. In other words, that is the sexual act between a man and a woman that makes them married. Okay. Now we're going to return to this because they have a lot of good things to add. But right now I just want you to understand what they say here, which is trying to get us to wrestle with our embodied nature. Listen. First, unlike ordinary friendship, marriage unites people in all their basic dimensions. It involves a union of minds and wills that unfolds in a sharing of lives and resources, but marriage also includes bodily union. This is because your body is an essential part of you, not a vehicle driven by the real you, your mind, nor a mere costume you must don. If a man ruins your car, he vandalizes your property, but if he slices your leg, he injures you. Since the body is part of the human person, there's a difference in kind between vandalism and violation, between destruction of property and mutilation of bodies. This point has been developed at length, but we can make it vivid by considering some of its other moral implications. What is particularly perverse about torture? That it uses some aspects of a person, their body and effects, against other aspects of his or her self, wishes, choices, and commitments. Why is rape gravely wicked even when performed on someone in a coma who never finds out and sustains no lasting injuries? It still involves misusing, abusing a person and not merely using and replacing intact his or her property. More positively, spouses find it beautiful and uniquely appropriate that their children are a mixture of their bodies. Couples see their infertility as tragic, uh, a tragic limitation even when they can adopt. Proud new parents care which child is handed to them in the maternity ward. Right? All of these point to our physicality, our embodiedness. The evidence, they say, of our embodiedness and of its value is all around us. Because of that, embodiedness in any union of two people must include bodily union to be comprehensive. If it did not, it would leave out, it would fail to be extended along a basic part of each person's beings. Okay? In other words, the union of marriage is so close that it must be a union of bodies because it's a union of you, and your body is you, okay? So, Paul starts to touch on this idea, and then he starts to tie it to our salvation. So the first thing he does there is he says, okay, wait a minute, you've just seen the body as temporary, as a throwaway, as irrelevant. That's wrong, and then he starts to emphasize it more. And so notice here in the second paragraph. He opens here in verse 15, and he says, Do you not know 
that your bodies are members of Christ? Now, do you not know is a teaching tool that Paul often uses. It says, you really should know better. But he knows they know what he's about to say. What they misunderstand is the implications. In fact, I think we do the same thing all the time. What does it mean here when we read, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? First, take that language, members of Christ, and remember that's not a definition of joining a club, like we use membership, right? But of being part of a body, memberment. And yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's not a real word, but dismemberment is, and it gets across the point, okay? In other words, Paul says, don't you know you're part of the body of Christ? And Paul loves this metaphor. He uses it later in Corinthians in 12, 13, and 14. He uses it in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, It shows up everywhere, but what he says here is not just you are part of the body of Christ, but your body is part of the body of Christ. When we talk about the union that we have of the church, it's not just a union of disembodied beings who park their car outside and then park their vehicle, their bodies in the seats. It's a union of bodies because it's a union of real people and we're embodied. In other words, you have been attached to Jesus, not just soul, but body. In fact, that's where he gets his logic. He says, shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Remember, again, this is not about joining a gentleman's club. This is about bodies and what happens in our sexuality. Now, there's a difference between our participation in the body of Christ and our participation in the sexual relationship of marriage. But they both involve a union of bodies because they involve a union of people. Now, we can, I think, stand with the Corinthian church and go, hold on, Paul. What do you mean when you say here that he who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? I go home at the end of the night. Prostitution and marriage are categorically different things. But what does Paul quote here when he makes his biblical case? He says, don't you know one who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now I think we read that and we recognize it as being a reality and ideal of the marriage relationship. But Paul applies it here to a sexual union that is so far away from that, we can say here very clearly that Paul says there's no such thing as casual sex. He sees every act of sexuality being significant and not casual. Now, a side note. I would suggest to you that prostitution is the most casual form of sex. And you might go, but we live in the age of hooking up. That's got to be more casual. We live in the age of friends with benefits. No, because those have relationships. Prostitution becomes economic. It's an exchange of goods for services. There's nothing more casual than reducing sexuality down to a commodity. And so when Paul applies this to that level, it impacts every sexual expression we can imagine that would be different or above that. Now, I think sometimes when we think through this thing, the two becoming one flesh, and even when we look at Paul handling it here, we think that what Paul is doing is saying there's something mystical, there's something magical, that when two bodies bang together in such a way, they somehow join their souls. In fact, I remember hearing uh, a a sermon when I was in youth ministry, maybe you can relate to it, where my pastor explained the damage that happens when a sexual relationship happens outside of the marriage by having two uh, construction paper hearts and a glue stick. And so he took them and he glued them and he put them together and as he talked he left them and then he tried to take them apart, but they don't come apart cleanly, do they? Some of the red construction paper is now on the gray. Some of the gray is now on the, on the red. And the idea is, again, that there's something irreversible and mystical that happens in our sexuality. Now, I actually think the point that youth pastors are trying to make is a good one. We all know the difficulty caused by the ending of a sexual relationship. We've seen it in lives. Maybe you've experienced it yourself. It's real. But I don't think Paul's point here is about something magical or mystical that happens. It's about the ideal of sex and its design, like we talked about last week in marriage, and how that ideal is not met in the casual sex one has with a prostitute. 
To understand this, we have to ask, what is the sexual relationship in marriage by design? Okay. And, uh, to do that, actually, it's helpful to move forward beyond where we are here in 1 Corinthians 6 to the next chapter. Now, in chapter 7, Paul deals with marriage, singleness, divorce, remarriage, and widowhood. He covers a whole lot of ground. But in the beginning here, he is talking about a relationship between a husband and wife, and in doing so, he engages with the ideal of their sexual relationship in a way that's helpful for us. Notice what he says here. Because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Okay. Now notice that there's a specificity to that. Not just each man should have a wife and each wife a husband, but her own He's not just talking about here getting married. When he says here, because of temptation to sexual immorality, he's not saying marriage is, uh, it deals with uh, what the early church used to call our compu, compucescence, right? In other words, you're tempted by sex, so get the place where you're allowed to have it, and then the temptation won't be such a big deal, which if you're married, you know is not a really good way to read the situation. It's not surprised that that term was, was created by monks and celibates, okay? Um, but here, it may be actually that what's happening in the Corinthian church, and this is hard to wrap our head around unless you have that particularly self-righteous and crazy uncle, that these same men who are frequenting prostitutes have gone to celibacy within their marriage because that keeps the marriage holy. But over here, what I do with my body is no big deal. The marriage is a Christian marriage. The marriage is of the Lord. And so here he says, own wife, please. Own husband, please. That's the way it's designed. But notice what he says next. He says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. He goes on, he says, don't deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, for example, to focus on prayer. In other words, it can be a form of fasting. But what I want you to notice here is a couple of things, okay? When we put the whole idea that Paul lays out about how sex works in the marriage relationship, this is how I would define it for you. It's mutual self-giving, okay? And let's unpack those. First, I, that mutual is really important. If you're a woman tonight, if you're a modern, if you're progressive, if you just turn on the news, when you hear that phrase, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, your ears perk up, right? That is the primary argument even of the pro-choice crowd about what's wrong with us limiting abortion, my body. But notice here that Paul puts it in both directions, He's not talking here about some sort of patriarchal ideal, ideal that reduces a woman's body to property of her husband, any more than he's talking about the husband's body being property of his wife's. In fact, notice how significant that mutuality is. Again, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise, the wife to her husband. And then he goes around again, for the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over her body, but the wife does. Now, it is worth pointing out that in Paul's world, there really was such a thing as sexism, just like there is in our world. And so we should rightly imagine people in the church who were nodding along when Paul says, that's right. They're thinking, that's right. My wife's body belongs to me. But when he turns it on his head, he does something that is completely unique for his times. Because he's not drawing from his culture, but from the biblical view. The one where man and woman are both created in the image of God. The one where man and woman are both created with a destiny to be fruitful and multiply and to rule over the earth that God has given them. And so the idea here of, uh, of sex and marriage itself is mutual self-giving. And so it is mutual both ways, okay? Um, in fact, we see this uh, expressed... In the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is a celebration of the love between a man and a woman. And there's a chorus. Uh, 
And the chorus uh, is repeated three times, but it evolves, but it makes this point very clearly. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Do you see that mutuality? One way and then the other. What's interesting is as their love goes on, because unlike a romantic comedy, it doesn't culminate in the wedding. The wedding's in the middle in chapter 6. But as it moves along in their relationship, it's the same, but it changes. Now she says, I'm my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. That's the opposite of what she said last time. It's a deepening. First, she says, my husband belongs to me, and I belong to him. Now she says, I belong to my husband, and he belongs to me. I would suggest to you that we have an inherent instinct that understands how that works, which is we're very reluctant to give ourselves fully to someone unless it's safe to do so. But after a while, she finds a greater depth in that initiating, being on the front end, giving of herself. Okay. Now, just as a side note, very quickly, the third time this comes up, it seems like the, the escalation is broken. I am my beloved, and his desire is for me. I think if we read that out of context, a lot of marriages, women would go, yep. That's, that's not the idea, though, here. The reason why this is the climax at the very end of the song is because of what we saw happens in Genesis 3.16 between the relationship of men and women. Her desire will be for him, but he will rule over him. Her desire isn't received and responded to in the way it should, but here in the Song of Songs, their marriage reaches a place where the curse is reversed. No wonder Song of Songs is basically a return to the Edenic Garden of Eden. Right? All the imagery is this beautiful place. Their bedroom is, is the lawn out front. The trees hang over them. They're celebrated by the birds. Okay? And so there's a full restoration here. But again, it's mutual self-giving. Now, that idea of, um, of self is important here. Okay? Because the body is an essential part of you. Withholding the body is withholding of self. Giving the body is a giving of self. Okay. Now we'll return to this idea in a little bit, but that last one is of, of giving, and that's important. When we go back here to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there's something that's easy to miss. Specifically, it's that the orientation Paul gives is what we owe to our spouse, not what rights we have of our spouse. In other words, his instinct is to talk about what we should be giving, not what we're owed. Okay? Uh, now, Jesus himself says it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's an understanding of love inherently that is built this way. But in sexuality, this is significant, and we will return to it. Um, but what I want to point out here is that the orientation is one of giving and not of taking. Now, when we put this all together, sexuality that operates outside of this context, mutual self-giving, not just the giving of your body, not just the giving of your time, uh, but the giving of your very life, all that you are, when you just and merely give your body or a financial transaction or these types of things, in withholding the rest of who you are, it becomes inherently and obviously taking. In other words, it's using. It doesn't take or receive or respond to the whole of the other person. It borrows their body for your physical pleasure. And this is true if the relationship is consensual. It's true if the relationship is loving. It's true if, uh, if it isn't what our world would call exploitation. The truth is, the truth is, we are aware that some sexual relationships are exploitative. In fact, when we talk about prostitution today, that's the first thing we talk about. But notice this. Listen to what Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians. Don't have time for that, but we do have time for this. We talked about this last week. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now listen to this. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this manner. Now, 
This is important. That word there for brother is unfortunately translated because it's andros, where we get androgyny. But brothers and sisters is a mouthful. And so translators have made the mistake of making it look like, like the Bible often only addresses men when it really is addressing us collectively as brothers and sisters. Now remember what Paul was just talking about, how we use our sexuality. And he says the danger here is that we would transgress our brothers and sisters. And that word there is an economic metaphor, that we would exploit our brothers and sisters. Sexuality, out of its design, which is to be giving of its whole self, because it only takes the body and doesn't give all of you in exchange for it, is inherently exploitative. Okay. Also, the giving of the whole self requires the relationship to be exclusive. Do you see how those two things go together? This is very important. We can't miss this fact that the giving of your whole self is not momentary, but everything that comes with it. Why is it that we join together people's economic resources when they marry? Okay. It's a joining of lives. It's a joining of destiny. It's a joining of debts. It's a joining of permanence. And the truth is, and we'll see this later, if you divide the gift, you divide the giver. There's no other way around it. Now, this also brings us to the concept of pornography. For us as Christians, there's no such thing as moral por pornography, and there's no way for us to be conscientious consumers. You know, our whole world right now is worried about ethical means leading to the production of products. For us, pornography, that is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the actors are free range. We don't care if it's cruelty free. Those things are important, but they're not the only important thing because it is still gratifying your own sexual desire without recognizing the wholeness of the person on the other side. You are just borrowing their body, or in this case, the image of their body, for your own sexual gratification. And so all pornography is inherently exploitative. In fact, just to push a button, I would suggest that applies to pornography in the context of marriage, and not just looking at pornography that involves other people, but that settling for photography of your spouse is substandard of the sexual design, okay? because it's not the giving of your whole self. Okay? Now, what I'm suggesting to you is when Paul says here, don't you know that he who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? What he's saying is, don't you know that you're robbing this person? Do you think that it's really fair to exchange you know, a, a couple of pieces of silver for a sexual act and that's fair play? No, it's, ex it's exploitative, it's using. Remember what he started with? All things are lawful, but does it edify? Is frequenting a prostitute loving? He says, no, it's using, it's taking. It's selfish. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and break right there. Um, I have a microphone right here. I need to stay here, so I have a microphone. But if someone would come grab it, if anyone has a question, uh, feel free, raise your hand, and we'll send the microphone around. Questions? Good. They don't have to be personal or earth-shattering. I went very fast tonight. If you just need me to recover something, that would be fine. I have a question about, um, there's a scripture in the book that says mortality will not inherit immortality or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm having trouble getting through your thought that Great. the body's going to be sitting in heaven, you know, you see what I'm so saying? So the passage you're referring to is 1 Corinthians 15, <laughs> and I would suggest to you that it's the most important chapter on this issue uh, that there is. And so basically what that passage suggests, let me pull it up here, you're right, is specifically that our mortal bodies will not inherit the immortal, okay? But... Paul's point in the context is what God's going to do about that is give us immortal bodies. 
And you go, but isn't that a new body? Does it still have identity? But remember the metaphor that Paul goes on to use, which is the metaphor of a seed. And although a seed and a plant look like different things, they're one thing. And not just one thing because they share some sort of DNA like two flowers do. They have one body that's gone through this transformation, gone into the ground like we will, and become something else but something the same. Okay? And so I'd encourage you, read 1 Corinthians 15 the whole way through, and the great emphasis there, again, is the physical re- resurrection that we're expecting. And it, you're right, it's not a resuscitation. It's not just divine paddles that shock us back into life. It is something that is wholly new. But even with the earth, we see the same thing. We are expecting a new heavens and a new earth, but that's not, uh, that's not deletion. It's replacing. It's restoration. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Justin, last time we talked about um, just the transitory nature of marriage. Yes. In terms of its, the reality of it is Christ in the church. Yes. And how the church expresses Christ. And, and today, it, it feels like you elaborated a bit on that in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Um, and the thing I'm wondering about is when you talk about those three dimensions, mm-hmm. isn't there a spiritual dimension as well in terms of what's in the, in the spiritual realm is, is expressed physically? Yes, yeah, I mean, a- absolutely. And again, I would suggest the reason is because it's, it's more than just the spirit expressing itself physically. You are spirit and flesh. You've never met a disembodied human being, right? Uh, And so everything we do is both spiritual and physical. And when we talk about the giving of yourself in marriage, of course that has a spiritual component because that's part of who you are. So how does that fit within the the scheme of the three dimensions? Right. Uh, Mostly it touches uh, this idea that we're going to talk about next week, this unitive relationship, okay? Where what I'll suggest is that the two becoming one flesh, although that's very much a physical image, is actually about um, one flesh intimacy, the sharing of all life. Okay? And there is clearly a spiritual component to that. In fact, Paul hits it very heavily in the context of marriage, and that's why he suggests that a Christian can't really marry a non-Christian and expect a full marriage because they have to hold a part of themselves back. Right? And so, so that's absolutely right. And again, let me reiterate that these three dimensions, just like if you had a solid cube in front of you, when you're measuring one, you're pushing through all the others. You can't separate them and take them apart. We're not building a box, but a cube. And so we will come back and fill in the blanks here because we're taking a different angle. I've got time for one more and then we're gonna jump back in. All right, let me just take the moment to remind you that the way that this material we're walking through over these 10 weeks works is all together, Uh, which means there are things that I'm just grazing across and we will revisit, and every time we will do it, we'll do it with needle and thread. And as we do it, we'll start to stitch together the quilt, and the connection between things will make more sense, and you'll start to see uh, the big picture. And notice I'm having to kind of borrow that collateral up front just to read 1 Corinthians 7 or 6 rightly, I'm filling in a lot of gaps that we take for granted, but I'm drawing from the big biblical framework that we talked about last time. We still have one uh, paragraph to take a look at tonight. It is um, definitely the most significant and impacting, and it'll also give us the foundation, because the truth is we haven't really gotten to talking about sexual desire at all. Um, We've been talking about the embodied nature of sexuality, but we haven't even talked about what eros is or this idea of erotic. And so we're going to pick up here in verse 18 and look at this last little paragraph here, starting in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. And this is what it says. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. 
This is Paul's crescendo. This is his climax. But notice it opens with flee from sexual immorality. Now notice that's strong language. He doesn't just say avoid. He says run from. Right? They're they're saying this is no big deal. And he's actually going to say here it's a really big deal. It's not just something that you should avoid, but something that you should flee from. In fact, if you've been a student of the Bible for very long, that language may even evoke a particular biblical story in your mind. It's hard for me to think when Paul says flee from sexual immorality, he's not drawing specifically from what happens with Joseph, right? Joseph, who is uh, enslaved in Egypt and working for a man named Potiphar, And he does very well in there, and he becomes kind of the head of the household, and he takes on basically all responsibilities that Potiphar is responsible for, and then there is Potiphar's wife. And so Genesis tells us here, after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, Because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything in my charge. He's not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. And so his logic here is, but you belong to Potiphar. And remember again, if Joseph is thinking biblically like we saw tonight, he could also say, and Potiphar belongs to you. Okay, it's this mutual self-giving that causes him to respond here and then secondarily notice this, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Okay, and so it's not just a sin against Potiphar, but a sin against God. Why is that the case? Because Potiphar's wife is God's creation in God's image. Because sexuality is God's gift in God's design, okay? Because God as creator and we as creation, he determines the rule. And so this is how he responds to this. But remember what happens next. She continues to press and to push and she finally grabs him by the robe and he disrobes just to get out of there. And it is because of that, running out of the house naked, that he's imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit. When we take that image and we bring it back to Paul saying, flee from sexual immorality, it's a strong image indeed. Considering Paul basically says here it would be better to do the time than the crime, right? He's saying that that Joseph makes the right action despite the fact that it's that fleeing that leads uh, to the next downward step in his life. Now, probably you know the rest of the story. Um, And so that's not as significant. But again, Paul opens up here strongly, flee sexual immorality. Now, the next thing he says is that uh, here in the ESV, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now, again here, I would suggest what we're dealing with is a Corinthian slogan. And that's hidden by the translators trying to be helpful. You may notice in my version up here, the word other is in brackets. In fact, if you look closely at your Bible, in your Bible, it may be in italics. It's because the word has no Greek equivalent in the Greek manuscript. It's been added to help us understand, and it's easy to understand why they made that decision. Because what does it mean if he says every sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body? What's the contrast there unless he meant... All other types of sin are different than sexual sin. But if this is a Corinthian slogan, then we don't need to correct things because Paul can say, yes, but, right? He's not contradicting himself, but responding to the false understanding of the Corinthian church. And I would suggest to you, not only is that a convenient way to read this, but structurally it makes more sense of the passage. What happens in the whole passage here, like Paul always does, involves a significant structure. And so notice, here in this first paragraph, as well as what I'm suggesting there in verse 18, he speaks the words of the Corinthians and responds to them. Directly following that, he opens his real answer with, or do you not know? And so he says, you say, but, you say, but, you say, but, and then he says, but don't you know? 
And then he does it again. You say, but, but don't you know? Right? And so I would suggest here, he is not, he's not distinguishing sexual sin as being the only sexual sin against your body. Suicide is always the easiest one that comes to mind. There are other sins that are inherently physical sins, even against yourself. Instead, they're basically saying, the Corinthian church is saying, sin is just something the body does. It's external. It's an act. And he goes, that's not how it works. The sin doesn't just affect other people. It doesn't just harm the prostitute or your partner in casual sex. He says, don't you know that sin affects you? The sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you remember how he opened? All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful to other people. All things are lawful, but not all things, I will not be a slave to anything. Not all things set me free. Here, that's the part that he begins to address more directly. Okay. The sexually immoral sins against his own body. Why is this the case? Because sexuality is at the heart of the human condition. And so the sin of sexual sin is harmful to personhood. It goes against the grain of who you are. In other words, it doesn't just deny the wholeness of, of yourself to another person. It divides yourself as well. I'm not familiar enough with this church to know if this is a bad idea, but consider Harry Potter. In Harry Potter, uh, you discover that what this evil wizard has done is basically divide himself into pieces so that he can't die all at once. He does that through murder because murder divides the soul. It's called a horcrux. What I'm suggesting to you is sexual sin does a similar thing. It makes a horcrux. It splits you. It divides you. It goes against the fullness of how it's supposed to be designed. Okay. Helpfully here, Jonathan Grant says, Christianity views human identity as holistic in that our sexuality is an essential part of who we are. Despite attempts throughout history to place sexuality at the edge of human personhood, the doctrines of creation, incarnation, and resurrection, as well as the divine blessing of marriage, all infirm our embodied existence, including sexuality as essential and ongoing, although we will express it differently in the age to come, like we saw last week. Okay. And so what he goes on to say is that when we engage sexually with our bodies, we forget that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay. So not only is your body you, but because of your relationship with Jesus, it's the place where God dwells. And notice again, this is the body. That's a little bit more physical than I think we usually think of the indwelling spirit. It's not just a concept, a, a metaphor of God's closeness or work in our life. He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, what is the temple in biblical thinking? If you go back and you look at the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament, it's the place where God dwells and it's the place where people come to meet with God. Right? In fact, uh, when we follow the temple through, it's very shocking and surprising when we get to the place where Jesus is like, yeah, there's not going to be a temple anymore. It's going to be torn down. When he says to the woman at Samaria who asks, where should we worship? Because our people worship here on Mount Gerizim, but your people say Jerusalem. And he says, a time is coming and now is when those who worship God because he is spirit and truth will worship him in spirit and truth, not here nor there. And I think there's a tendency even to take that passage and remove it from the broad teaching of the Bible and think that is a de-physicalizing, but it's actually a multiplication of the physicality of the temple. Because for Christians, we collectively, that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, do you not know that you plural are the temple of the living God. But here, do you not know that your body is a temple of the living God? Now, if you've ever read through the book of Leviticus, which can be a challenge, you know that there is a, dis dis a distance, a distinction that's made between sexuality and presence in the tabernacle. 
And when we read that forward and recognize ourselves as the temple, we start to get at what Paul is suggesting here, that it is incompatible with this reality that our body uh, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like uncleanness kept you from the tabernacle in Leviticus, now that you are a tabernacle, uncleanness is incompatible. It doesn't make any sense. Now the next thing he says is, for you were bought with a price. And you are not your own. Now, generally, when we read that passage, uh, we think of redemption, as we should. One of the ways the Bible talks about our salvation is economic in nature, that God has bought us out of slavery. Okay. But when Paul says here, uh, do you not know that you were bought with a price? What is the context that we've been talking about? Prostitution. It's jarring, isn't it? Paul knows how to be provocative, and he's clearly being so here. In other words, if we wanted to, I, I, I don't think a Christian sexual ethic can fit in a tweet. I think that's one of the great mistakes of our time, is trying to communicate in such a limited format, and when things are just way more complex than that. However, if we were going to try, we would suggest that the summary of the passage here is that bought people don't buy people. But notice how that creates a problem. Because what were we saying earlier? Hey, wait a minute. The thing that made prostitution or casual sex so significant is that it was an unfair trade, reducing what is uh, you know, beautiful in God's design down to an economic nature. So why can Paul so comfortably apply this to what Jesus has done in our life? Well, first and foremost, remember the words here of Peter. This is in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, Knowing that you were ransomed or redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Now, when the Bible evokes blood, it connects it with life. When it talks about the shedding of blood, it doesn't mean that you accidentally cut someone. Right? And when it talks about the fact that we are saved by the blood of Christ, as much as a t-shirt might tell you otherwise, it's not a blood transfusion that did the job. When it says here the blood of Christ, it's not presenting an alternate currency, it's talking about death. In other words, what makes this different than prostitution is Jesus didn't just give something, he gave himself. In fact, he gave his body. He took on a body and redeemed our bodies with a body, a full, all-encompassing exchange. In other words, and we're getting on sacred ground here, we're in places that can be easily misunderstood, but what I'm suggesting to you is not only, like we saw earlier, did God take on a body because he wanted to save all of us, the whole of us, and the body is us. But he did it in an embodied way. He did it in an embodied way, and that says something more significant. Jesus took on flesh so that he could give it fully and freely and completely and comparatively to our being, which is embodied. Okay. And so, no, us being bought with a price is not equivalent by any means to prostitution. When it says here, we belong to Christ, and again sacred territory, we can return, and Christ has demonstrated he belongs to us. I mentioned in our first week that if we're going to understand sexuality, we have to do it in the context of the image of God, which means we don't just stop with how do we live our lives, we look beyond to what does our lives say about who God is and the relationship he desires to have with us, and Paul makes that connection explicit here, doesn't he? Not in the context of marriage, but in the context of prostitution. Talk about a stretch. But how does this work? This brings us to being able to actually think through the concept of eros. Okay. When we talk about erotic desire, we're recognizing an embodied desire. Okay. You may long for the presence of another person, but 
erotic desire isn't satisfied in a phone call. It's physical, right? It's tied to this embodiedness, okay? Now, the mistake that we make, and it's because of the loose way that we use language, when we say erotic, like for example, an erotic dancer, we reduce erotic desire to a smaller thing than it actually is. The ever helpful C.S. Lewis gets us out of this hole by saying this, sexual desire without eros wants it, the thing itself. Okay, so we have sexual desires. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about Eros. Eros is more than that. Eros wants the beloved. Okay. It's a desire for the self, and that self is physical, so it's a physical desire, but it's not a desire for the act. Proper understanding of erotic desire can't be satiated by any given means or by any given person. It wants this person. When we read in the Song of Songs, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine, and when we see that expressed in a sexual relationship in the context of marriage throughout the Song of Songs, which, side note, is tremendously erotic, even though it is not explicit. Right? There's not a lot of anatomical language in Song of Songs. It's metaphorical. It's euphemistic. I say that because I would suggest that if we were looking for a way to artistically express sexuality as Christians, we can learn a lot from the Song of Songs, which is way more erotic than we would normally be comfortable with, but is not explicit. But the desire is both physical and holistic, and it's because the person that you want is both a whole person and therefore an embodied person. Now, I think we actually need to push C.S. Lewis a little bit further here because of what we've seen tonight. Here he says, Eros wants the beloved. In other words, C.S. Lewis says that erotic desire is the desire that you would belong fully and completely to me. But what did we see about sex and its design? That it's not about taking, but giving. And so I would suggest, and some of you have even found this deep in yourself, that these deep longings we have that are sexual in nature are not the longing that someone would belong to us, but that we would be able to fully give ourselves to them. Okay. Now, what does that tell us about God? You see, the thing is, for, for most of the thinking on this topic, usually as far as we get is erotic desire somehow is like this longing we have for God. So maybe you've heard the old and famous quote that is always attributed wrongly to G.K. Chesterton, the man who rings the bell at the, at the brothel is looking for God. And there's a truth there, right? Every deep longing we have expresses a deeper longing we have. Like we saw with Augustine last week, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. That's why the chasing of sexuality, and it doesn't matter if it's in the, um, you know, the pantheon of sexual experiences of our times, or the over-idolizing of marriage doesn't bring us what we're looking for. Because like we saw, it's a shadow, and the substance is something greater, something more significant. But here's the thing. What did Paul say earlier in the chapter? The body is meant for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. What I'm suggesting to you is that Eros doesn't merely or even most appropriately describe our love for God, our longing for God, but a longing in God's own heart for humanity. Eugene Rogers uh, I don't have this quote in my slide, and part of the reason is because Eugene Rogers' book is terrible. It's, it's one of the most frustrating reads. He plays with the scriptures in a way uh, that, that drives me crazy. Um, but he has this one sentence, and it shook my world because I'd been spending time in 1 Corinthians 6. This is what he says. He says, Eros may or may not be a good description of the love by which God loves God. In other words, maybe it doesn't express Jesus and the Father, and the Father and Jesus. And that would probably make us uncomfortable anyways, but we'll see 
there is something about that Trinitarian relationship that we find in marriage. We'll see that next week. But he continues, he says, but it is the principal description of the love by which God loves human beings. The love by which God loves human beings is eros if eros is a love that yearns for union with the other, yearns for the flesh of the other, is made vulnerable and passionate for the other. Now, I would understand if that language makes you uncomfortable, but where do we get the word passion? From the crucifixion. Christ takes on a body, and that body suffers. Christ comes for us, and because we are embodied, comes embodied for us, longs for our whole selves, not just to download our consciousness and upload it into heaven, but all of us, because you really are your body. And while we were rebels, sinners, Christ died for us. This is love, John says, not that we loved God, but that God loved us. Eros points us to something so deep, so profound in the heart of God. Uh, and I don't think we always see the significant of, significance of that. And let me remind you of two things. If that is the case, if that is the case, that marriage and its design when it functions is a little bit relativized because it's just a sign that points us to the thing that's signifying. Let me remind you, men, that in the relationship you have with Christ, you don't play the husband but the wife. And so marriage paints a picture for you in your wife, in her role, as the recipient of that dying love. It's profound, isn't it? What I'm suggesting tonight is that God's love for humanity is passionate and that it expresses itself in a way that we can understand because by design, God gave us eros, this longing to give ourselves fully. My beloved is mine and I am his. But that language fully, completely, ultimately is fulfilled in the union we have with Christ. When we will be with him, physically, forever, unseparated by death or sin or time or distance. And so it relativizes whether these desires are met because we can rightly channel unmet longings into their ultimate fulfilling. But it also gives tremendous significance to what we express with our sexuality because either it rightly images this God or it reflects something different. Just by way of illustration, this is a little bit harder to do in such an intimate topic, but consider the fatherhood of God. Isn't this the case? How many people's upbringing, how many people's example has tarnished their understanding of God? And not just their comfortability with this word father, but the idea of father the one from whom all fatherhood is named, it says in Ephesians. I would suggest to you that when we wrongly use our sexuality, we wrongly image, even to our partner in those sexual acts, who God really is. But again, we've only covered tonight one dimension of sexuality. This isn't enough to understand a Christian sexual ethic. This isn't the fullness. I was going to say the depths, but it's pretty deep. But it isn't the fullness of what we're talking about. And if we just stopped here, we'd have a leg on our stool instead of three. And it's a very difficult place to sit. And it also misses the profound reality because the great thing about God is he's infinite and transcendent. And we can't settle for a single metaphor can't be reductionistic and just reduce it down to this. Can we even understand tonight that if we just took this one doctrine and said this is who God is, how it would, how it would lessen people's understanding of God instead of increase it. But nonetheless, it needs to be spoken. It needs to be said. In fact, without this, people reduce Christianity down to 
something less than this loving, unified relationship that's expressed in loving sacrifice. And it's not just going through the motions, is it? Christ didn't just take on a body and then just mute pain and go through the motions. He became embodied and lived out suffering and death. Let's pray and then we'll take some questions. God, I find for myself that learning sometimes requires speed because you need to see the whole map. You need what they do in a golf game when the helicopter flies over and shows you the whole uh, of the, the whole of the whole before you start playing. And then there's other times, Lord, where we just have to sit and stop and ponder and confess like Paul. Oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Where we're struck again by the love you have for us that we thought we understood. Lord, I pray for the people in this audience. I pray for myself the prayer of Paul in Ephesians 3 when he says that God would work in us a tremendous strength so that we might have strength to comprehend the love of God. On our own, we are too weak in fact, you say that you desire for us to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge. Apart from God, it is impossible for us to see this for what it is. And so I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us eyes to plumb the height and length and depth and width to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And for those of us who are deeply wounded, not somewhere else in our life, but right here in our sexuality, in the way that we've been used, in the way that we've harmed our own personhood by dividing ourselves in such a way that you would meet us right here and we would recognize, Lord, that that is the humanity you love. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We have some time to take some more questions, and then I'd love to send you home early, because I can't promise it'll happen again. Where'd the microphone get to? Any questions? Yeah, Rick, right over there. You just, you just wave it and say, Lumos. Uh, Justin, um, you know, this realization that um, sexual sin when perpetrated is damaging mm -hmm. all around, mm -hmm. uh, perpetrator, victim to some extent, but how, how would you distinguish or is there a distinction uh, be between the, the perpetrator and someone who, for all intents and purposes, is a victim? Mm -hmm. is compelled, is, you know, mentally or physically. Yeah. Well, let me, let me actually start by, by addressing those of us who are culpable in this. Because as much as we need to talk about the other side, this is the one where we worry, where you read about this and you go, am I too far gone? You know, have I, have I walked this road? Have I done damage that is now irreversible? Um, and, and the thing that we have to remember is, for one, that's what redemption is all about. God doesn't just forgive us of our sins, he remakes us in his image. Um, but the second thing we need to remember is, is that what we cr create and cultivate in habits is recreated and uncultivated, if you will, through habits. And so it takes time, it takes sanctification, it takes progression. Like we saw with... Um, with Francis Schaeffer last week, because Christ has come, we should expect healing. Because Christ hasn't returned, we shouldn't expect perfect healing. And that's true of, of restoration in these things. But of course, restoration is available. And the thing that we sometimes forget when we turn to those who have been um, taken advantage of sexually, who have been sinned against sexually, um, is that Christ also died for those sins. 
And one of the ways that I think is best uh, to get to that understanding is to contrast the difference between guilt and shame. Now, guilty acts can lead to shame. But what's so difficult about being sinned against is it also brings shame. Right? And we see this especially in the realm of sex. That's why we have to make such a significantly safe place where victims can speak. Because it is shaming to be a victim. Because you become you know, shamed by association. That's how shame works. It's contagious. Guilt isn't contagious. Guilt stays where it lands. But shame, because it's about who you are and not just what you've done, it rubs off on other people. You know, look at abused children. It, these things are inherently relational even when they're not. But Christ comes to deal with shame. He comes to bring restoration in those things, to give a cleansing. You see, a lot of times when we think of cleansing, we think of, of dirt as a metaphor for guilt. It's not. It's a metaphor for shame. And when we look at Leviticus, we think how backwards that there were all these things that they had to do to be in a place of cleanness. What those are are paths back to restoration in community. That's what they are. And they're really just pointing to the big restoration in community that, um, that does a couple of things. And some of them are a little counterintuitive. One of them is it puts justice in the hands of one who will be just. And so it takes victims and it promises them restitution. And that restitution may be fully and completely fulfilled in the cross. But if not, there is a righteous judge who sees all things. Okay. And so those two ideas together, the ideas of justice and the idea of how God deals with our shame and gives us what in its place? Glory. Right? Because you were connected to this shameful person and that brings shame. But now you're connected to Christ and that brings glory. Anyone else? Yeah, right, right here in the middle. I may have missed this because I missed the very first part mm -hmm. um, this evening. I heard that this is on our website for last week's. Is this true? Is it on the website? So yeah, also, Austin's uh, nodding in the background, so yeah. Yes, okay, that's great. So that's good to know. Because it's, it's deep and wide and it's different and it's a part of the Bible. It's like... This is why I teach it everywhere because I need to review it. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One up here. Yeah, Bianca. Uh, hey. Um, <laughs> I just was really intrigued by the point that you made at the beginning about how sexuality by the world can be viewed as either it's just super physical basic need but also it's by which... The, the means that they describe and identify themselves completely, mm -hmm. apologetically, and kind of maybe even simply like elevator pitch type style. Like, how would you describe that distinction to someone in the world um, who is, you know, identifying themselves as by their sexuality? Right. Yeah. So we'll talk more about um, about homosexuality in the second half of the class, about five weeks from now. Um, and that's where sexual identity really comes in. Um, one of the things we need to recognize is, is that when we read tonight that this is an inherent part of our identity, and then when the world says this is an inherent part of our identity, we mean two different things. We mean sexuality as a part of humanity in its broad context. That's a shared thing. Um, but the idea that, uh, that where we differ is that the way that we go about living into our identity is through expression, right? And so, so sexual identity comes from a place that says who I really am is on the inside, which side note, let's deal with this right now, is our fault. Remember the Gnosticism that I mentioned earlier that we're just on the inside, soul and spirit? We've cultivated that so much in the church that this culture is our bastard child, okay? That's why this re-establishing of the body is so significant, but obviously, Emphasizing the body doesn't remove the desire, does it? In fact, somehow it makes this more complicated because it is a physical desire for someone else's physical nature, which is physically different than what the Bible points to, right? Um, but the, the issue, uh, like uh, we talked about this last week, I don't think you were here, um, uh, Bianca, but uh, there's different ways to resolve that crisis of identity, 
And one is the organismic, which says, I need to be who I really am. But there's also the telic way of achieving congruence, which, which focuses on becoming, which, which ties to purpose and changes those things. You know, like, I mean, this is such a trite illustration, but, uh, but I honestly and all the time crave hamburgers. <laughs> and I could fully lean into that and make that part of my identity. I could be the hamburger guy. And there would be some happiness there. But if I want to be healthy, then that involves restraint in desires, even though it is still an identifier and maybe even an aspect of identity. And most importantly, healthiness and wholeness get us back to that idea of God's design, right? And so, so it's that injection of purpose that makes all the difference. And again, that's where the church has tremendously failed those who are same-sex attracted. Is all we've given them is uh, what Eve Tushnet calls a vocation of no. You can't live out a vocation of no. And nobody is called to. What God offers them is not a boundary and a limitation, but a fuller life. Isn't that what Jesus said he came to bring? I seem to recall I did not come just to give life, but abundant life. Those are the things we have to rediscover if we're going to communicate to our culture. Uh, I saw Frank in the background, all the way in the back. What I'm wondering about is um, when you become um, one with someone outside of marriage, mm -hmm. if a person is very promiscuous, mm -hmm. Does, does their life become fragmented? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Um, going back to that youth group metaphor that I mentioned, um, we don't have to demonstrate to a watching world the damage of sexual promiscuity. It's all around, you know. Um, Premarital Sex in America is an amazing book by a couple of sociologists. We'll deal with it a little bit more in this class as we go forward. Um, but one of the things that struck me when I read it is they finally explained to me why marriage is on the decline. I thought the culture didn't want marriage. They actually wanted a tremendous amount and they're terrified of divorce. Why? Because they're children of divorce, right? And, and that breaking shapes their childhood. Um, so there's a book. It's either called Authentic Sexuality or Sexual Authenticity by Madeline Selmes. And she was a lesbian and an atheist and met Jesus and her husband all in the same summer. And so it's, it's, it's an explanation to all of her friends, all of her family, all of her community of what happened. Uh, and, and it's a great read because it's Thomistic in its apologetic, by which I mean Thomas Aquinas. In other words, she appeals to natural logic of what we all know to be true as opposed to rank and file chapter and verse scripture quoting. That's what um, What is Marriage with Sharif Gurgis did earlier, right? They're looking at what we all know to be true and just reminding us of it. Um, but in it, she makes this idea that I think is so compelling. She says, we grew up in this place that wasn't as it should be. And it's like we were born into a garden and the walls were broken down and the weeds, you know, the beds were full of weeds and the fountain didn't work. And so we fled it, she says, speaking of herself, of chosen family, of this idea of these other things, of sexual revolutions. She said, we fled the garden for the wilderness. And she says, to be honest, the wilderness has its own type of beauty, but it's not a garden. She says, but it has yet to seem to occur to us that we might be able to build a better garden. That is the place that we live in. And, and so, so getting back to this idea, um, I, think, I think sexual promiscuity does extensive damage. And we just have to look at what it does in the breaking of marriages and then just multiply it in the continuous serial monogamy breaking of relationships. Um, one of the things... Uh, one of the things that I would suggest in, in that concept um, uh, is that uh, is illustrated by pornography. 
how is it that we got to a place where objectification of women is so significant? Because we turned women into objects. <laughs> it's that simple. We have reshaped how we see other human beings and what they are by how we handle other human beings and what they are. And that's happened culturally, but it also happens for the individual. And I will tell you personally that every sexually immoral knot I tied before I got married, I have had to slowly untie. Just because I now have a sanctified or set apart or by design sexual marriage doesn't mean I'm a different person. Um, but remember, just because you're a virgin in marriage doesn't mean you're sexually pure. Just because you begin in this place, you still begin bent and you bring the most significant thing that it corrupts our sexuality into every marriage, which is selfishness. And so we've also got to watch out from conveying this thing that everything will be fine if you just keep it in your pants. That's not where we start as Christians. We believe we live in a broken and fallen world with twisted and bent hearts. Your kids need Jesus. And that shouldn't surprise you. Good. I think we're going to go ahead and stop there. I wanted to just add one last thing. One of the things I love about these Q&A times is, one, we've done a lot of culture touching tonight that we won't actually do in the lectures. And so when you have questions, please ask them, because that's where we can draw from this and build. Um, but that would be a whole other series. Okay. First, we need to lay the foundation. Then we can build upon it. But foundation is, our, is the name of the game now. Um, second is a lot of times it helps me to see things in new ways. Um, and one of the things that was pointed out to me the last time I did this, uh, a gentleman who'd been a Christian for a long time after this particular lecture, and he said, do you think there might be some discomfort with this imagery for those of us who are men? You know, this idea of erotic love of Jesus Christ. And I said, yeah, sure. But also remember that the Bible calls all women to be sons, right? Gender in terms of the metaphor it uses to describe relationship with God moves in both ways. We both have to lean into, into the differences to see the reality. Um, and and uh, one of the things that proper sexuality brings us is unsexual and intimate heterosexual relationships, which is another thing our culture is dying from right now because you can't cultivate good relationships with the opposite sex if the elephant of the room of the possibility of sex is always around, okay? Um, and, and that goes into this reality too, and so, so, and, and the same thing with now, same-sex, non-sexual, homosexual relationships. We look at David and Jonathan, and David says, your love is more significant to me than the love of women. And we go, whoa, take a step back, David. That makes us uncomfortable. That's our problem, not David's. That's our cultural blind spot, not David's. We have lost the ability to have non-sexual intimacy, and we're dying from it. One of the reasons why people are so starving for sexuality is because they're losing all the other intimacies that are so significant. Families are broken, so they're not getting the parental intimacy they need. Friendship can't happen, so they can't get the friendship intimacy they need. And we make the mistake of thinking what we're missing is entirely and utterly sexual because we're so starved. Not for sex, but for intimacy. Anyways, thank you for coming tonight. Um, same time next week. And next week we'll add another one and we'll look at the more relational, the unitive aspect of marriage. Uh, have a good night.